Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, Andy uh, threw me under the bus a little bit last week. Not really under the bus, but like uh, under the bus of text messages and Facebook messages of uh, think uh, of, of wishing me a happy birthday. So uh, it's the big four one. Okay, so um, yeah, I think am I over the hill yet, David? We we turned. We, you got 20. David and I share a birthday. So, and then also Cody, uh, Cody's daughter, uh, Alex, she shares a birthday with me. And we got a bunch of November 10th. Tim Brandon has a birthday the same day as us. And as I always like to say, the great reformer Martin Luther and I share a birthday and the Marine Corps. So, um, so anyway, it's a very popular day. What's that? You ain't no Martin Luther. Well, I always think of myself. He would have been 541 years old on my birthday just uh, just last Sunday. So, um, what's that? Oh, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I voted for her for for uh, school board, and uh, she got it. Everybody. Yeah. Good job, East Hartford. Um, we got her in. But uh, I was I had no doubt. But anyway, uh, I'm sorry to embarrass you. But I felt like I should. Um, but we let's get down to business today. We're in the book of Matthew, chapter 23, and uh, um, this is a tough chapter. Uh, this we've been kind of leading up to this chapter uh, in the in the weeks prior, in the in the time prior to this, um, in the chapters prior to this. Uh, Jesus has entered Jerusalem, as we've talked about, and he's uh, he's he's confronted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, two very prominent religious groups uh, of the day, and uh, and Jesus is is tackled uh, is is tackling. Questions Questions that they're bringing to him, and uh, and it's really a like an onslaught that that they're trying to to trip Jesus up and put him in a position where uh, they can they can quiet him and quiet those that are following him, uh, and so that's well, this really is where everything kind of comes to a head, and uh, and this is uh, we're going to split chapter twenty three into two, uh, or actually three because Andy started us last week, but we're going to uh, chapter uh, chapter twenty three verses thirteen through the end of of the chapter really is the the seven woes uh, where Jesus tackles the uh, uh, directly tackles the um uh, the, the, the religious leaders and, and takes on the arguments and the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. But we're going to split into two. We're going to do this week, we're going to do the first uh, few of the woes. And then next week, we're really just going to tackle one woe, uh, one of the, uh, the, the the warnings that Jesus gives uh, the religious leaders. And really, as I'll make the point today, these these warnings aren't so much for the religious leaders. In some ways, Jesus has kind of taken the, the tact of Paul in Romans chapter 1 and just basically... Uh, sort of washed his hands and let them uh, sort of pursue their own way. And, uh, and and his real worry and his concern is for the other believers, those that are following him, those in the crowd, those disciples. And that's who he's really talking to today. Um, and, and as I was thinking about this, like, so if you, if you own a house, and, and most of us in this room, we own a house, all of us in this room live in some sort of complex, right? A building of some sort. And if you, but if you had the opportunity, like if you had the opportunity to design your own house from scratch, right? And some of you have had the opportunity to do that. And this would probably still be true of you because if you have the opportunity to design your own house, to, to, to come up with exactly the kind of house that you wanted, you would want money, not an issue and make it exactly the way you want it. I don't know about you, but many of the ideas I would have would come from the things that I don't like about my current home or, or, or things that I didn't like about my homes that I've lived in in the past. Do you understand what I'm saying? So like in, in mine, if it was for me, um, I would want my house to be on a nice, quiet street. Because now we live on Clay Street, right? And there's like, uh, it would be quiet because there would be no Harley Davidson motorcycles driving down my road at all hours of the night, okay? If you drive a Harley, I'm sorry, but you don't need that. that I, at 41 years old, I don't want to hear your Harley exhaust, okay? I'll just be honest with you. I mean, I liked, I used to love the sound of cars and motorcycles. Nowadays, it's like, why does it need to be that loud? They ought to sound like Hondas, right? Um, but it would be nice to be quiet street, right? It wouldn't be having all the crazy cars driving by all the time. That would be one thing, right? And I would have a lot of countertop space in my kitchen, and it would not have this 
awful breakfast nook that somebody in 1920 or 1930 decided they needed a breakfast nook inside their kitchen when they had a dining room right next to it. Just eat your breakfast in the dining room. Why do you need a breakfast nook inside your kitchen? I don't understand it. But we've got a breakfast nook in our kitchen. And I've talked to Jerry before about getting rid of that breakfast nook. We still need to talk about that one of these days, Jerry. But anyway, but it wouldn't have a breakfast nook in it. It would have a lot of countertop space. It would have an indoor pool that cleans itself and a basketball court, right? I said money wasn't an issue, all right? But see, the optimal, the ideal, are often shaped by the flaws we see in what we have, aren't they? And, and this translates into all kinds of areas of life, right? I mean, it translates into uh, the cars that we drive, right? We oftentimes will look for a new car. The, the car that we want is, the, is, 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 is the, has the things that our car doesn't have, right? If I was going to buy a car right now, mine would have heated seats. If you have heated seats, you know what I'm talking about. It's incredible, isn't it? It's the greatest thing in, that God's ever made, I think. And I think God was behind it. But it's like a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. Everything's going to have heated seats in it in heaven. And cooled seats, too. I don't have those yet, but I think I bet those would be good as well. But, you know, if you, it, 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 ha, it translates like the ideal or the, or, the, or the optimal. It translates also in the jobs that we have, right? So the jobs that we want to have would have the features of the job like that, that, that aren't included in the job that we currently have, right? Flexible hours or maybe a better schedule or maybe more pay or a, a less demanding or a better boss or whatever, right? Because we're looking at the optimal and saying, I don't have the optimal. I want the optimal. I, I want the ideal, right? And even how we raise our kids, right? I know we have all said this at some point. I will not say or do what my mom or my dad used to say or do, right? Anybody said that before? Come on, be honest with you. So you're, it, sometimes watch it because your mom might be in the room. That's dangerous up here, isn't it? But we do, we say that. Like, I'm not going to say that to my kids. I'm not going to do that to my kids. And because the optimal, the ideal is not... Now, of course, we do take some things from our parents, right? I mean, it's not all bad. But there are things. Like, we're talking to my dad last weekend, and there's some things in my dad's upbringing that he's like, that's not going to be in my house. And he wasn't. For the 18 years I was under my family's house, my dad did not act like his dad. And I'm glad he didn't because he wasn't the best dad. So the optimal is oftentimes in the things that, looking at the things that we have and saying, that's not what I want for the future. Here in chapter 23, Jesus is painting a picture of his house. And what I mean by house is not an actual physical dwelling place. It's, it's his church. Remember back in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus says that, that when after Peter makes that amazing claim, that, that amazing declaration, you are the Christ, you're, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. Everybody says that you're a prophet. Everybody thinks that you're somebody special. But we know that you're like the greatest thing that's ever came. You are the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God, the one that people have waited on for thousands of years. We know that that's who you are. And Jesus says, right, you're right. And upon that declaration, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what's Jesus' church going to look like? And, it, and Jesus has already built the ideas. Like Jesus has the, the blueprints of his church already labeled. Like how is his people going to look? Well, he's already shown us how his people are going to look in the way that he's living. In the way that he's healing. In the way the miracles that he's doing. The signs of the times. He, he, he's, he shows us what his church, what his people are going to look like in, in, in what he's teaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, right? And, and all the, 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 the parables that he's taught. He's, he's teaching us what his church is going to look like. But what he's now saying in chapter 23 is, this is not what my church is going to look like. See, in a, in a way, what Jesus is doing is he's comparing the new church, the new people, to the old ones and saying, hey, in the new creation, in, in, in my church, in, in, amongst my people, these are the things that are not going to be present. And so that's why that's what I want to look at this passage today. What, what Jesus does, and you'll hear this as I read it, he really, the, the combination of the, of the woes comes in 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1. What I mean by that is there's seven parables 
But they're comboed together. The first two are, are the same sort of idea. The second two are the same sort of idea. And the third two are the same sort of idea. And then there's one that stands by itself. And that's the one we're going to look at next week, okay? This week, I want to look at the first six. And really, we're just looking at the first three because they're, they're making the same point, okay? And what I want to talk about is these are... What Jesus is really doing here is he's showing us what kind of people we are going to be. Or what kind of people we should be. Who who is his church going to be? Who are we going to be? And that's what I want you to hear in this passage today, okay? So let's let's read this in its entirety. I'm going to read all of chapter 23. And the reason I'm going to do that is because it really is one long discourse. And we're going to just cover a part of it today, but you have to really read it in all of its context in order to understand it fully. So we're going to do that both this week and next week. Well, I'm sorry, we're not going to read all of it. We're going to read 13 through the end, but we're going to we're going to read all of 13 through 39 today and next week. So just go ahead and you know if you want to show up late, don't. Okay, because you need to hear it. Okay, but here let's dive in uh, to chapter 23, starting in verse 13. It says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You shut the door on the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you, don't go, uh, for you don't go in, and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel over the land and sea to make one convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever takes an oath by the temple, it means nothing. Whoever takes an oath by the gold of the temple is bound by his oath. Blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? Also, whoever takes an oath by the altar, it means nothing. Whoever, but whoever takes an oath by the gift that is on it is bound by his oath. Blind people, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, the one who takes an oath by the altar takes an oath by it and by everything on it. The one who takes an oath by the temple takes an oath by it and by him who dwells in it. And the one who takes an oath by heaven takes an oath by God's throne and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin, and yet you have neglected the most important, the more important matters of, uh, of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat and gulp down a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may also become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but inside are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we wouldn't have taken apart, taken part with them in shedding the prophet's blood. So you testify against yourselves and you are descendants of those who murdered the, the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors' sins. Snakes, brood of vipers, how can you escape from being condemned to hell? This is why I'm sending you prophets and sages and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. So all the righteous blood shed on the earth will be charged to you from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all these things will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her? How often I want to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, may you um, grow its influence in our hearts today, God. Through your spirit, God, may we hear your voice above all the other voices that we're listening to, God. Above my voice even, God, will we hear your voice. And God, would it, would it transform our hearts? God, change us and shape us. 
And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Jesus has been talking a lot about hypocrites in the last few chapters. And a hypocrite really is someone who puts on a, a false face. That's the, the Greek meaning of the word is, is, is like an actor that puts on a false face, a, a mask. And it pretends to be someone that he or she is not. He's confronting the religious leaders in Jerusalem who've, who've deemed Jesus a threat. And they're trying hard to get him out of their hair, to, to quiet him, and to, to quiet the, the, those, that are trying to, those that are listening to him and following him. And in chapter 23, Jesus turns to the crowds that have been following him and his, and his, and his, and his disciples who, who are with him as well. And, and he begins to call out the hypocrisy of the two most influential groups among the ordinary people in Jerusalem, the scribes and the Pharisees. It's likely many of the religious leaders, that like maybe most of the scribes and the Pharisees, maybe have already left at this point. They could, some of them could still be there. Or maybe they're in the distance, or, or, or maybe they're right up front. We, we don't really know. We don't get this real strong picture. But at the end of chapter twenty, uh, at the end of chapter twenty-two, it seems like many of them they didn't have any more questions, and so it seems kind of like they may have moved on. So Jesus isn't so much confronting them directly, even though he is taking them on, absolutely. And if they're there, they're there to listen. It seems rather Jesus is, is more concerned with the crowds and the disciples, knowing who these scribes and Pharisees were and, and where they stand with God. It, it seems like Jesus is more concerned about warning the people of the influence of the scribes and Pharisees more so than he is about warning the scribes and the Pharisees. In, in some ways, Jesus, I think, has, 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 has assumed, and, 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 and light, rightfully so, that the scribes and Pharisees, they're not listening because they've they spent the last three years trying to, 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 to quiet Jesus down and attacking him and, 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 and doing all they can to, uh, to, to get rid of him and his influence. And so it just seems like Jesus is more so warning the people, don't be fooled into thinking these men are worthy of following. They're just a bunch of fakes. He does this in seven woes. Now, woes are not like, whoa, whoa, Nelly, that kind of idea. It's, 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 it, these are warnings. These are judgments. In the same vein as the prophetic judgments of the Old Testament, when, when, when God would send a prophet to, to declare that his people were being judged, they were being even punished for their waywardness because they weren't following him. And so he would come and he, the prophets would, would say woe to the people. And in the same way, in the same vein, Jesus is warning, he is, he is judging the scribes and the Pharisees. Don't be fooled. He calls them hypocrites. He calls them blind guides. He calls them fools. He calls them snakes. And then he even broadens the snakes. He broadens it and then zooms it in to the brood of vipers. Not just snakes. You're not just snakes. You're like a whole really nasty pile of snakes all mashed together. That's what you are. Isn't that like if you have one snake, that's that's nasty. That's scary. Maybe you like snakes and I might be offending you today. I'm sorry. I don't like snakes. I'm not like scared of them like spiders, but like I don't like snakes at all. But if I walked into a room and there was one snake, that'd be one thing. Right. But if I walked into a room and there was a whole bucket full of snakes all slithering around, that's a whole nother thing. Right. And that's what Jesus is saying. You're snakes, but you're even worse than that. You're a brood of vipers. This is very much a warning to the crowds and the disciples and the religious leaders all listening against hypocrisy. But Jesus is also painting a picture. He's designing a house by pointing out the flaws and the frustrations in the current one. The, the Jewish people, these men represented the, 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 the covenant promises of God from the Old Testament. God came to his people. In Abraham, and he said, listen, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. And, and that was a promise that God made to his people called the Abrahamic covenant. And then later on with Moses, he makes a promise to Moses. If you stick with me, if you do as I call you to live and live as I call you to live and follow me in my ways, then I will bless you and multiply your influence and you will be a witness to the nations, right? And that's the Mosaic covenant. And then with David, he, he brings the Davidic covenant. He tells David, he's like, I'm going to bless your family. 
family and, and, and there was someone that was going to come from your line that will bless the nations, that will establish my kingdom in this world. And all of these covenants, these promises, these Jewish leaders are the keepers of them. In a sense, that's God's house. The temple is the representation of God's presence with his people, but the people were really to be the ones that God was present with. And yet, this house was not living up to what it was supposed to live up to. Have you ever been to someone's house they just recently built and you're and you walking through and you're like, yeah, this is wrong and this is broken. And, we, and you're like, man, this is a brand new house and they're already kind of frustrated with it, right? That's kind of how God was. God said, I built this house and you guys have ruined it. You guys have not lived up to the expectation. But it was always God's plan to send Jesus. It's always God planned to build the right house, and that, that one house was just a, a, just a glimpse at what the real house is going to be. And we, as his people, are his real house. And like my breakfast note, Jesus is saying, in my new house, his people, whom are called his church, will not be present. He ain't going to have no breakfast note that doesn't make any sense inside the middle of his kitchen. We need to see this as a warning to us, but also as the opposite description of who Jesus wants us to be. See, in these first two woes, what Jesus is really saying to his people is, I want a people who are gracious and welcoming. A gracious and welcoming people. The scribes and the Pharisees, they, they were a harsh and legalistic and judgmental people, weren't they? I mean, you guys have seen it if you've been walking with us. They're harsh, they're judgmental, they're, they're, they're legalistic. They're so focused on the law. They didn't invite people to know God personally. That wasn't their agenda. The Pharisees and the scribes, they, they, it wasn't about knowing God personally. It wasn't having a relationship with God. It was about appeasing God. They didn't know God as, as, as a, a personally, but they knew him as a judge that they must prove themselves worthy to. John Piper defines legalism as the conviction that law keeping is the grounds for our acceptance with God. And it's a failure to be amazed at grace. Isn't that a good definition? It's, 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 it's a conviction that us keeping the law, checking the boxes, doing all the right things would, would allow us to be accepted by God. And it just totally ignores the idea and the concept and the beauty of grace. We as a church oftentimes sing amazing grace, right? We, we sing the Chris Tomlin modern version, which is nice. But we still sing Amazing Grace. But do we really know Amazing Grace? Or are we really kind of thinking of our relationship with God based on how well we're doing, keeping up with all the laws that we think are going to make us acceptable to God in His eyes? See, the, the, the Jewish leaders, they didn't see God as loving and slow to anger and kind and welcoming. They saw Him as a mighty, holy, and demanding God. And He is. And that's the thing that's so crazy about the, the Bible. Because you see God in the Bible as this mighty, righteous, demanding God who demands us to follow these laws and to walk in His ways. And yet at the same time, we can hear the Psalms speak of God as slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And He's the same God. And we want him to be that God because we want justice and righteousness to rule in the land. Even if we don't like justice and righteousness in our own lives, we want it to be the, the we want that to be the, the law of the land. We want justice to reign. We want righteousness to be the guide for our people. We just sometimes don't want it in our own lives. But here's the thing, like we feel like we've got to either believe in God as this holy, righteous, demanding God, and so we can't see Him as a loving, inviting, kind, slow to anger, and loving God. We, we can't have them both, but we can and we do. And that's, that's what Jesus is trying to speak to these people. He's trying to speak to these Pharisees and these scribes. But most importantly, he's trying to speak this to the people. Don't let them misrepresent my God to you. My Father, who I am. 
Don't let him misrepresent you to you. See, they saw themselves as the doorkeepers. The Pharisees and the, and the scribes, they saw themselves as the doorkeepers, the, the bouncers for who can get close to God and enter his kingdom. Jesus is calling them out for shutting the door of the kingdom in people's faces through their rigid and overbearing system of laws. See, they would stack the laws on top of each other. They would say, well, you know, you need to make sure that you don't work too hard on the Sabbath. And so here's ten laws to follow to make sure you don't work too hard on the Sabbath. And then all the while, they're missing out. Jesus says, like, the Sabbath wasn't meant for man, but man for, or man wasn't meant for the, whatever he says. Jesus basically says that the Sabbath was meant for us. It was meant to, to bring rest to our bodies and to our souls for us to trust in God. And they missed the boat altogether on that. They were taking away, they were robbing the blessing from the Sabbath. They're robbing the blessing from the law by stacking the laws on top of each other. They were shutting the doors to, to knowing God and, in, 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 and building a relationship with God. And that's the oddest part, because their view of God, which was the source of their self-righteousness and legalism, also kept them from really knowing Him and having a relationship with Him. Do you see what Jesus says to them? He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you don't go in, and you don't allow anybody else to enter. You don't know God, Pharisees, that scribes. You have a knowledge of who He is, but you don't know Him. And you, you see yourselves as the ones that are the, the bouncers, the doorkeepers of the kingdom of God. And all the while, you can't even get in yourself. They not only keep people from entering, but they also kept themselves outside the door. And Jesus has been showing all those watching and listening a better way. He's showing them the way, right? He says... I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, he says, I am the way. Listen to me, follow me. Don't follow them, follow me. And he's been showing them to be true, to, to, the true heart of God and his desire for his people. And, and we've gotten glimpses of it throughout the gospel of, of who Jesus is and who he's creating us, his people, his church to be. Remember back in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, he says, When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion on them for, because they were, were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus shows us compassion for the crowds, compassion for us. Throughout his ministry, he healed the sick, he restored the sight to the blind, he welcomed the rejected, he forgave the sinful, and he preached a message of hope to those who were willing to believe in him. Yes, he, he preached hell. And we're going to talk about that in a couple in a few weeks. He preached hell. He talked about hell, but, but he offered an opportunity for those who would believe in him to not have to experience it. Hell was for those that rejected him. See, Jesus offers this message of hope. I didn't come to the world to judge the world, but to... Offer salvation to, to accomplish salvation for those who would believe in me. John 3, 16 and 17 and 18. Jesus came for the sick, not for the well. Remember what he says in Matthew 9, 12? Now he heard this and he said, It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. He came for the sick, those in need, those that see their need. And Jesus wants a church that embraces Him and His way of life. He wants a church. He wants us to take on the same attitude, the same lifestyle. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. He wants us not to live perfect lives. We can't live perfect lives. That's not his goal. It's not for you to have a, a checklist in the back of your Bible that you look at every week and make sure you checked all the boxes of being a good Christian person. That's not what he wants. He wants you to live like he lived and love like he loved and, 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 and welcome and invite as he welcomed and invite. He wants a people that knows and promotes grace as we've experienced in Christ. Have you really experienced grace? It's unmerited favor. It is a gift that God gives those who trust in him. You can't earn it. 
He wants a people who know and promote grace. He wants a people who invite lost and hurting souls to hear about a God who loved them by dying for them, to free them from the condemnation of their sin. Not a people that are just going to lambast them with condemnation after condemnation. No, give them the gospel, the good news to a lost and dying people. He wants a people that welcomes everyone and invites them to find new life in Jesus. Now, if you hear what I'm saying is some kind of far-fetched idea that's, that's not close to the gospel, then you don't know the gospel. I'm not saying Jesus condones us in our sin. I'm saying Jesus offers us a solution for our sin problem. And so much of the time, our message is a door shut in people's faces. You're not good enough to enter the kingdom of God. And the thing is, the person shutting the door in, your, in that person's face... They're not welcome in the kingdom either a lot of times. Because they don't understand grace. Here's the second thing, the second parable. Jesus is pointing out the scribes and the Pharisees. They were serious about the law, at least parts of it. But what Jesus desires for his people is to be a faithful and generous people. See, the, the, Jesus points out the, the three areas where they, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were really serious about the law. One was in taking oaths. There's a couple of circumstances. See, they, they, they saw, they were particular about what people could and, 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 could and couldn't swear on. Couldn't make an oath on, right? And, and for the, the scribes and the, the Pharisees, if, if you went, if you made a, an oath on the temple, then that wasn't a valid oath because you got to make that, that you can't really, that you can't really like, if, if, that, if you don't keep the oath, you can't really take anything from the temple. But you got to make an oath on the, 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 the gold in the temple. And if you were going to make an oath on the altar, that doesn't really matter, but you've got to make an oath on the gifts given on the altar, right? They were really particular about what you could make an oath on. Arguing that oaths, like, that, that there was like a particular way that you should do it, right? And then Jesus says they were also really particular about tithing. They were really serious about giving 10%, even down to the smallest of herbs. You, you see what he, he says in there? He says, um, what do you describe? He says, um, uh, uh, wait, what I, what I missed it. Um, what, where am I at here? There we go. Mint, dill, and cumin. Um, I lost my, I lost where I'm at. But he says, even down to the herbs, even down to the mint, the dill, and the cumin, you give even 10% of that. They were so serious about that. Jesus had called them out before over in the Sermon on the Mount of how they boasted about giving and, 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 and how, they, how they, they, they had this like chip on their shoulder about how well they were givers, right? Then he also focused on purity laws. He also briefly points out how serious they were that, that they took the purity laws, even running their wine through a strainer in order to keep this, this from swallowing a gnat, which would have been unclean. That little statement at the very end there, he says, you, you, you run your, your wine, he says, you... Um, you, you run your uh, blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but gulp out a camel. They were so focused on these little bitty things. And then don't misunderstand what Jesus is doing here. Tithing matters. Telling the truth matters. What you do with your money and your mouth matters. But the problem is, they were intensely focused on these, and yet were basically ignoring God's commands to love and care for the needy. They were fixated on these little bitty nuances and yet they were missing God's heart for those that were hurting, those that were in need. Jesus is painting a picture of people who completely lost their sense of proportion. They were majoring in the minors. He's not making light of these things, but he's saying, listen, like what is actually changed in your heart if, if what you pursue is these little bitty nuances, these little bitty tiny things, when these glaringly obvious things are right in front of you? See, they looked for every conceivable reason not to help the poor and oppressed and the needy and looked down on Jesus for sitting with sinners instead of having compassion on them. They despised Jesus for healing a man with a withered hand instead of wanting to, to see the man healed. They cursed Jesus for casting out a demon 
out of an, another man instead of rejoicing that he was finally free. They, they were, they, they're total, totally mixed up in what they understood to be the most important. He's not, Jesus isn't downplaying the obedience and righteousness. He's actually, actually lifting up obedience and righteousness, saying, if you truly believe in me, if you're walking with me, obedience and righteousness are going to define who we are as a people. But it's going to be motivated by love for God and love for man, as he said in the previous passages, right? He said, what's the most important laws? To love their Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And likewise, to love your neighbor as yourself. Your love for God will drive you to neighborly love as well. It's the same thing Isaiah said hundreds of years before when he, when he opens up. God is speaking this through Isaiah. And he says in Isaiah chapter 1, what are all your sacrifices to me, asks the Lord? I have had enough burnt offerings and rams and, and the fat of well-fed calves. I have no desire for the blood of bulls and lambs or male goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires this from you, this trampling of my court? Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon and Sabbaths and all in the calling Solomon assemb solemn assemblies. I cannot stand iniquity with a festival. I hate your new moons and your prescribed festivals. You have become a burden to me. I am tired of putting up with them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourself. Cleanse yourself. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. And plead the widow's cause. Jesus is, 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 in a sense, doing the same thing as I did a hundred years ago, hundreds of years ago. He's saying you're doing all these religious duties with missing the heart behind it. Saying the same thing that John says several years later. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. Don't focus on the minors. Focus on the majors. Jesus' desire is for be a people, for us to be a people who live faithful lives of obedience to His Word and His ways. And He desires for us to be a people who generously care for those around us. Listen, you might be a great American Christian, but are you faithful? To his word? Are you compassionate? Are you a generous follower that Jesus, the, the kind of follower that Jesus desires? How has knowing Jesus transformed the way you love and serve others? That's, that's the heart behind this, this challenge that Jesus makes to the Pharisees and the, and the scribes. He said they know all kinds of things. They, they are so intent about the law, but they miss the things that really matter. Here's the final two. Jesus calls them out for being clean on the outside, but being dirty on the inside. He uses two analogies, the bowl, the, the, the dirty bowl on the inside, but they clean it on the outside, and then these whitewashed tombs. See, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were known as godly people. They presented themselves as righteous and pious and deeply spiritual, but Jesus is pointing out their true nature, the true nature of their hearts. In the springtime, before the Passover, when people would from all over the lands would come into Jerusalem, it was custom to whitewash the roadside tombs so that no one coming in to Jerusalem would mistake the and, and mistakenly touch uh, and be rendered unclean by by one of the tombs as they entered Jerusalem. See, if they didn't whitewash the tombs, they might just look like rocks. And so they wanted to make sure that it was very clear that these tombs, as you're coming into Jerusalem, were, were, were tombs. Don't touch them, because if you touch them, that you'll be deemed unclean. And although those tombs looked beautiful on the outside, we all know what was on the inside. And there were dead bones and bodies and rotting. 
See, the scribes and the Pharisees looked like those tombs. Outwardly, they looked so beautiful and clean. Inwardly, they were unclean, dead, decaying, putrid. Jesus' words would have been outrageous for the people to hear and incredibly risky for the Pharisees to have learned about if they weren't there. Right? I mean, if they heard what Jesus was saying, like this was, you're comparing us to whitewashed tombs? These, these guys were the best of the best, teachers of the law, the holiest and righteous among the people of Jerusalem. And yet Jesus is saying it is only a cover for how dirty and dark and dead you are in your hearts. See, the warning to us should be obvious in these images, right? I mean, this, these are pictures maybe we don't see on a, on, on a regular basis. It's not something we don't walk by whitewashed tombs as we're walking down the road. But we get the picture, right? It, it's like when you pull out a bowl and you're, you know, that you thought was clean. Especially if you have kids, this happens sometimes, right? You pull out a bowl, you pull out a, a pot out of the, out of the cabinet and, and you go to put your food in it. And, and you realize, well, that thing wasn't clean, right? It's got dirty nastiness all over the side of it. And somebody didn't clean that thing. It looked good when you're pulling it out. But when you start to see this is nasty. That's what these Pharisees were being compared to. That's what we are being compared to. See, this is a warning to us. It, it, watch out for keeping up outward appearances and yet neglecting inward holiness. It's not that our outward appearance doesn't matter. It's that it matters less than inward holiness. It, if we make every effort to cover our sin and hide our need, we clearly have not understood the gospel and have not embraced grace. See, the Pharisees believed they were right with God because of how they presented themselves, but they walked in darkness. Some of us, like we walk into church and we've got our nice clothes on, or maybe you just wear sweatpants and a t-shirt. That's fine too. But you come in here and we present ourselves as like, hey, I've got all my stuff together. I've got all my ducks in a row. But like, what's going on in your heart? And I'm not saying that for you to feel guilty. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But let's just admit, like, listen, folks, like, I struggle with sin, with doubt. I'm a pastor of a church, and there's times where I get angry or I get anxious. My big anxiety right now is this week, my pool cover, I have like had to pump some water off my pool cover. And then I look out at my pool to, in the last couple days, and I'm like, wow, is there enough water in there? Do I have a leak in my pool? Maybe my liner's got a leak in it. I better watch that. And so I start feeling my chest get tight and anxiety come on. I'm like, this is a stinking pool cover. Why am I getting all anxious about this? I can work on it last next year. I don't need to get worried about my pool cover. But I literally have like shortness of breath because maybe my pool has a hole in it. Why am I getting overwhelmed by things like that? My daughter's about to finish the sixth grade. She's halfway through sixth grade. She starts middle school next year. And I'm like beside myself in anxiety over that. Why am I so worried about that? And I, am I in sin? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's sinful. Not all anxiety is sin, but it's, a, it's lacking trust in God. And like, I need to bring that before him, don't I? But here's the thing that we do. We just put on this pretty face and say, I'm good. I struggle at times with anger towards people. Maybe even people in this room. Not in this room, but the next, the next service, you know. <laughs> but I struggle with anger. What does Jesus say about anger? Anger is the same as like murder. And I struggle with that. And yet I put on a pretty face. Some of us are deeply into sin. We're addicted to things. And it is ravaging our lives internally and maybe in places that nobody else can see. But when you get home, you know, you know that selfishness, that sin, that destruction that's happening in your life. And yet you present yourself as everything's put together. And that's, that's the craziest thing about ministry is everything in family seemed to be going really well. And then all of a sudden you get a phone call. Hey, this happened. And you're like, I had no clue that was going on. I wish that was just one time in my ministry. But the reality is it's happened every year. Sometimes too often to count. Because we struggle 
with having a really clean exterior, and yet things inside of us are dark. Things inside of us are, are destructive. Things inside of us are hurting. Things inside of us may be even dead. So what is Jesus saying? Who are you really? I think is what he's saying. Are you one, one way when you're at church and around other believers and yet you're totally different when you walk into work on Monday? Are you, who are you when no one's watching? How does your faith in Jesus influence how you treat people you interact with throughout your day? How does it influence how you spend your money and organize your time? How does it influence your marriage and how you treat your spouse on good and bad days? How, how, how does it influence your relationships with people at school and what you do or don't do with your boyfriend or girlfriend and no one else is around? Listen, the world is crying out for genuine witnesses. The world is crying out for a people who are genuine and humble. Genuine and honest. I think I maybe even... No, I didn't change it. I thought I went around but humble, humble and honest. The world, I think the world is crying out for people who are real, who are authentic, who are humble, who are honest, who are bold enough to be who God has called us to be and saved us to be. He doesn't want a bunch of fakes. And I'll be the first one to admit, man, sometimes I'm just a big fake. A lot of times I feel like it. But let's be a people who are genuine. Let's be a people who are humble. Let's be a people who are compassionate and kind. Let's be a people who just exude grace and, and, and forgiveness. Because that's the heart of our Savior. Who are you going to be? Who are we going to be? Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for your grace. God, your grace is sufficient for us in our weakness, God, and we are weak. Um, God, we're needy. We're lost and wandering at times, God, and I pray, Father, for your help. God, we need your help to... to we need your grace, God, to, to, to remind us of... Um, the depths of our sin and, and the goodness and sufficiency of your death on the cross for our sin, God. God, we need your spirit. And I pray, Father, right now, Father, for those in this room that are convicted because of sin, because, God, they, maybe they've been living lives that look good on the outside, but they know deep in their hearts, God, they have not been walking with you. They're riddled with anxiety. They're struggling with addiction. They're deep into a pit of sin and they don't, can't quite see the way out. And God, the, the first step towards health, the first step towards, um, towards coming to a place of healing, God, is for them to admit it. Admit it to you, admit it to themselves, and maybe even admit it to someone else, God, especially those they've sinned against. God, to just to, to admit, like, I, I may look good on the outside, but I'm breaking up in the inside. And God, just to, to, to rest in knowing that you are God who is compassionate to those who are willing to admit their need. That's the very heart of the Beatitudes, God. If we, God, for those who mourn, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed, God, blessed are those who understand their need for you. God, we are so proud to, to struggle, to, that we struggle to admit our need, that we struggle to admit our brokenness, we struggle to admit our sin, God. And yet we're reminded in John that for those who confess their sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So may we come to you, God receive the forgiveness and the grace that you offer us in Christ. We thank you for your grace and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.